What's happening? Welcome into the Matt Bernier Show, part of the In The Money Media Network. My name is Matt Bernier. You can follow me on Twitter at Bernier underscore Matt. This is episode 27 of the new and improved Matt Bernier Show for Tuesday, August the 11th, 2020. However you listen to this thing, thank you for doing so. A number of ways to find this podcast. You can listen audio only on Apple Podcasts or your Android device or over on InTheMoneyPodcast.com where you can also find all the other podcasts that live under the In The Money umbrella, including the Players Podcast, including JK Plus One, including Talk Race to Me with Naomi Tucker, as well as the Red Board Rewind with Spencer Luganbuehl. If you are so inclined, you can watch this show over on YouTube. All you need to do, go over to YouTube in that search bar, type in Matt Bernier Show. You'll find this episode along with the 26 prior episodes and if you want to get involved in the friday feature this is where you need to do so uh, again questions comments concerns as always welcome beneath the video player on youtube or over on twitter wherever you're listening though whether it is on the apps that you have or on youtube please subscribe rate and review give us thumbs up thumbs down whatever it may be five star four star whatever the reviews are on the podcast apps please do that because it helps us get things out when it comes to advertising and all that other jazz and then when push comes to shove all that kind of stuff helps us get more content out so all of that is greatly appreciated what's on deck for this week uh, i'm going to keep my pieces relatively short had a really nice interview with howard kravitz the winner of last week's friday feature he will give you an idea of what's to come this week in a really salty Non-winners of two other than up at Saratoga. That's going to be the Friday feature for this week. Saratoga's ninth race. If you're trying to get involved, that is the race you need to leave. One selection. Because the Chad Brown horses are a coupled entry. You need to select the winner. Leave it beneath the video player on YouTube. If you're the only one, I will contact you. We'll get something going if you are one of many. As has been the case recently. And tip of the cap to everyone for doing well. Uh, randomly pull out the number. Whoever gets it. I'll contact you and we'll go on from there. So that's coming up. First, I will talk about the three grade ones from Saratoga. Then after the interview with Howard, I will dive into my Breeders' Cup Classic Top 10 ranking for this week. So without further ado, let's just roll right into it. I don't have many sort of uh, profound thoughts on the performances that we saw in the grade ones, the grade one ballerina, the grade one test, the grade one Travers. The ballerina, it was an exceptional performance I should say, look, exceptional performances from all three of those horses. An exceptional performance, though, from Serengeti Empress, given the fact that she is a need-the-lead type at this point, and for her to be hustled out of there the way that she was, to set those fractions and still be able to hang on late, I thought it was just a giant effort all around. The only concern that I would have going forward is how uh, do we go to the bottom of the tank here in this spot? And you know what? If if that's the case, so be it, but she's a... She, she got a grade one going shorter. And I think that was one of the things that I was, you know, I, I didn't have any issue with the races that she had run this year. I know some people were, were looking at the, the Fleur de Lis saying it was a ridiculous ride. I disagree. I, I, I said it um, on one of the shows. I said it on the, uh, pl- the happy hour last week, uh, Horse Players Happy Hour. That's her game. you got to try to bottom out the field, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But at least go out using your best asset, and that's exactly what they did with this filly on Saturday afternoon. She just she wasn't quite the fastest out of the gate, but they used her speed, and they put the boots to the rest of the field. They put away the other speeds. They held off good horses and Bellafina and come dancing, and they were able to get the job done. So now not only is she a grade one winner as a three-year-old going a mile and an eighth, she is a grade one winner going seven-eighths of a mile as a four-year-old. Uh, she is going to be a fascinating broodmare prospect when all is said and done, whenever it is all said and done. Uh, credit goes to Tom Amos and company. Really impressive performance. I'm just going to be very curious to see how she bounces out of a race like this and an effort like this. Because, boy, did she have to work hard to get the job done. But she got the big prize. She got that grade one next to her name in that race. Now, on the flip side, you had a much different circumstance play out in the test. You had the two horses. uh, I was on ABR uh, Breeders' Cup Live on Saturday. And I I just thought it was pretty cut and dry. I thought it was a two-speed number. Especially when you took Wicked Whisper out of it. It felt like it was going to be Gamine. It was going to be Venetian Harbor. The two of them were going to go. And I thought Gamine was a better horse. That wasn't to say that I didn't think Venetian Harbor would run well. I just thought Gamine was better. Um, The pace situation was on the softer side, let's put it that way. I don't think it made a difference. I I respect everyone involved with Venetian Harbor, and I have seen 
uh, ownership group on, on Twitter pleading their case about they didn't like the ride. And I can respect that. I mean, look, you're paying the bills. Um, I frankly don't think it made a difference. Uh, I think even if she went to the lead, uh, I think she was going to get her doors blown off. And I don't mean that uh, as a knock to the Philly. I think she's very, very talented. But, I mean, she, she was running against a different horse on Saturday. And, and Gamine, to me, the bigger picture is going to be, what is Gamine? Because I know a lot of people, myself included, I sort of threw out the possibility on Saturday. You know, you take a look at it. Kentucky Oaks is obviously in play now. Uh, if the, the Derby doesn't fill, do you cross enter in both races to see what it looks like? And then I went back and watched the tape a little bit more. And I watched the gallop out. And I watched this race, or I shouldn't say this race. But I, I watched the, the race in the gallop out. And then I take a look at the campaign. And the way that they have run her throughout her career thus far. And just just so I'm not incorrect, I want to double check here. Let me pull up a quick little piece on the past performances so I don't misspeak. But I'm pretty sure the only time that she has gone two turns was in the second lifetime start down at Oaklawn Park. And she did not run poorly there. She won. But the bigger piece, and, and I'm not including the, the disqualification due to the drug situation, the overage on lidocaine, or I believe that's what it was. Um, the, the bigger thing for me, though, is, yeah, they've kept her going one turn three different times. She's tried to go two turns once, and she got real short at the end, and a good horse, admittedly. Speech is a really talented racehorse. I, I can't help but think there is a reason that they are not trying to go or they haven't tried to go two turns again with her now given the timing of everything maybe the turnaround from the grade one acorn to the coaching club american oaks is a little bit quick but i would have liked to have seen especially when you see the field that ran that day i mean talent wise she towers over the girls that ran in the oaks i just i find it curious that they haven't tried going two turns with her again just yet and the way that she galloped out, it it left me wanting. Now, maybe she's just a freak of nature, and she's going to go off and do whatever whatever she wants. But I would, but before we crown her, before we crown her, at least consider that. Bob Baffert is, say what you will, whatever your beliefs are. I think Bob Baffert does a tremendous job of placing horses. And I find it odd that he has not gone two turns with her more than the one time down at Oaklawn. And that also happened to be the race where she almost got beat on the square as far as the race itself is concerned. And I'm not including the the sort of overage on the, the test result. I think it's fascinating. The prospect of her trying to go nine furlongs for the first time against what I think is a pretty deep group of fillies. Maybe she doesn't get the lead. She's got a ship to Kentucky. Ship doesn't seem like it's that big a deal. But the two-turn, mile and an eighth, if they wanted to try a race like the Derby even. But let's just focus on the Kentucky Oaks. I, I have a funny feeling there's a reason that we have not seen her go longer, go two turns specifically, other than that one run at Oaklawn when she started getting a little bit short at the end. Not saying she can't and won't win the Oaks. Talent-wise, she, I think she's very clearly the best. But, oof. I, I think there's I think there's something to keep an eye on. Let me know what you think beneath the video player on YouTube. And last but not least, I don't know what else there is to say. Um, you take a look at the way the Travers was run. And myself and many others billed it as a two-horse race. And it was going to be the showdown between the known commodity and Tis the Law and the upside, the unknown, the what could be in Uncle Chuck. And if you had told me to start the day that the way the race would play out was Uncle Chuck would make the lead and the opening half would go in 48 and 1, almost 48 and 2. I believe it was 48 36 to be exact. I would have said it's going to be really difficult for Tiz the Law to run him down or be in a position where Uncle Chuck's not going to get tired. And then you watch the race. And I think it's a tale of two different situations. A. No horse was beating Tis the Law on Saturday. I, I'm going to go as far as to say no older horse would have beat Tis the Law on Saturday. 
But it's also coupled with the fact that, that Uncle Chuck was absolutely putrid. He was terrible. And there's no other way to put it than I, I he was just awful. And and say say what you will, oh, it's only third start, oh, you know, got a ship cross country. And and these were questions going into it. But for a Baffert horse to bomb the way that he did, especially on the heels of seeing what Gamine did, I, I oh my goodness, I was so disappointed in that effort from that horse. That doesn't mean that he's going to, you know, that he's just a complete bum. I, I think it's, it would be foolish to write a horse off like that, who is still very clearly green. He was super late with the lead change. This is on the heels of his first two starts where he's popping back to his left lead for the final eighth of a mile. He still clearly needs to figure things out. But my goodness, he just he was a complete no-show in that race, and that was so disappointing. The thing that was not disappointing, though, and you, I, you know, I try not to get caught up in the moment, and I was fearful that maybe I was doing that a little bit on Saturday. But then going back and watching the way that he ran, and and maybe it would have been even better if we had that sort of proper showdown, which never materialized. But damn if he was not absolutely spectacular on Saturday, tis the law. He was, it was a sublime performance. I, I just, I there's there's nothing else you can say. when you When you lay out the entire situation, He's 3-4 wide throughout. At no point does it look like he's a loser. I, I would venture a guess to say that Manny Franco could have won that race with that horse without getting out of sort of the hands and heels sort of position. I mean, he was geared down for the final 16th of a mile. His ears were straight up. He galloped out better than anyone else. I mean, it was almost as if he, he rebroke past the wire going into the clubhouse turn. And he said, you know, he, he didn't even take a deep breath. And for the first time, not just visually, well, because visually he had done some really impressive things before. Visually he checked the boxes. But for the first time, when you take a look at the numbers, I can sit here and say, I, I think he's going to be a handful for the older horses. Prior to that race on Saturday, he had not run fast enough to really be viewed to me anyway in my by my estimation as a real threat to win the breeders cup classic with some of the figures that the older horses have shown they're capable of earning whether it's improbable or tom's data or any of these other types saturday when he jumps up into the 109 for a buyer speed figure and i believe it was a raw 127 time form us rating you know i mean this is now we are in now we've officially entered that big boy stage. And I talk about the different times throughout the year that I look for those forward moves. I think early on as a three-year-old, sort of in that that March to April leading into May, I think that's when you get a little bit of a forward move. And I think you get another forward move, sort of the July-August range. And then possibly you get another one as they turn over into four-year-olds. That's usually sort of the way that I look at it or, or my expectations to see these these incremental steps. And I really wanted to see that on Saturday. I thought it was going to be a much more difficult race for him. But even if Uncle Chuck, even if Uncle Chuck ran what I thought he could run, something in the low 100 range, he he was still going to get absolutely destroyed by very clearly the best 3-year-old that there is right now. And for the first time, I look at him and I say, this is a horse that can win the Breeders' Cup Classic even if the big boys run their best. Having said that, this is going to be a fascinating next few months for this horse and the connections. Because in theory, say he goes to Kentucky, goes to Louisville, wins the Kentucky Derby. Then you need to make a decision. Do you want to run back four weeks later, mile and three sixteenths in the Preakness? Which you could understand anyone that would want to with a horse of this caliber, given the way that he's performed. Potentially to win an odd triple crown. If you do that, that's your third race in three months, all three of them at a mile and three sixteenths or greater, two of them being at a mile and a quarter, the Travers and the Derby. If you do that, then you have to run four weeks later at a mile and a quarter again, taking on older horses for the first time at a track that you've never run at. I said it earlier, uh, you can find it, the Players Podcast. We had the Derby Draft. It was myself, PTF, JK, and Naomi. 
I'm not, I can't say that it's the same as, you know, sort of your standard Triple Crown run, obviously, for, you know, cl very clear reasons. But I would, there's a part of me that would look at this, this campaign, if this horse can go out there, and I know we're getting way, way, or at least I am getting way ahead of myself. If he can go and win the Belmont Stakes at a mile and an eighth going one turn, the Travers at a mile and a quarter, followed by the mile and a quarter Kentucky Derby, followed by the mile and three sixteenths Preakness to win the Triple Crown, again, albeit in an odd configuration, and then follow that up by defeating older horses in the mile and a quarter Breeders' Cup Classic at Keeneland, a track that he's never seen before. If he can win the, those final four races over the course of four months at a mile and three sixteenths or greater, all four of them, with one of them being against good older horses, with the likes of Improbable, the likes of Tom's Day Ta, the likes of uh, Code of Honor, anyone else that you want to throw into the mix, perhaps Midnight Bisu, uh, anyone. I, I, would, I would almost, I would go as far as to say that would be among the most impressive performances, individual campaigns, since I've been paying attention to the game. And I would, I would argue over the past 25, 30 years, that would be a pretty substantial accomplishment for this horse. And the way that he's moving, um, you know, I, I don't have any reason to be anxiously awaiting or, or the, the prospect of trying to beat him the first Saturday in September. I think there are other really talented three-year-olds. I think it's a pretty good group all around. Um, I just, I'm not in a rush to, to bet against this horse. Not now, anyway. Not against the three-year-olds. See what happens when we get down to Lexington. But Tis the Law is an absolute superstar. And I would be... If you had, if you got a mare, whenever it's it, it's all said and done with him as far as racing is concerned, if you've got a mare, I, I think this horse could be as good at seven-eighths of a mile as he is at a mile and a quarter. And that, to me, is the hallmark of, of some of the biggest and best that we've seen over the past handful of years. I mean, you go through, and I'm including two-year-old form as well, but you look at American Pharaoh. You know, he won the mile and a half Belmont. He won the grade one uh, Del Mar Futurity. It was his first career victory, going seven-eighths of a mile. I think of a horse like Shared Belief, who won the grade one Malibu. He also won the Pacific Classic at a mile and a quarter. You know, that's not a small feat for a horse to be able to do that. There, you you got to have you got to have it really really tight. You got you got to have your game on, and and to have the brilliance going shorter, as well as be able to sustain that going much longer. I love his versatility, but if he works out trips like this, he's going to be an absolute bear. And and I just he's such a likable horse, and the connections are very likable, and um, just just a, a sublime performance from Tis the Law. It's Saturday's Travers. Let me know what your thoughts are about the three grade one races beneath the video player on YouTube or on Twitter at Bernie or underscore Matt. Let's pivot into the Friday feature for this week. Again, it's, this, it's the ninth race at Saratoga on Friday afternoon. It is a non-winners of two other than a mile and three sixteenths on the Mellon Turf course. Howard Kravitz was the guest this week. He was the lucky winner from last week's Friday feature, and he will try to guide us to victory here this Friday. We'll talk about this race, and then when we come back, I'll dive into my Breeders' Cup Classic Top 10, and we'll get you out of here in good order. Without further ado, this week's Friday feature. Feature time, the 9th at Saratoga, this coming Friday, that would be August the 14th. It is a mile and three sixteenths on the Mellon Turf course to help us out. Last week's winner, Howard Kravitz, one of, did I pronounce that right, Kravitz? You did. Okay, like Correct. Lenny. Exactly. Like Lenny. Um, yeah, very, same thing, of, different spelling. <laughs> One of a few folks who correctly identified the winner last week in the Saratoga special. What was the uh, what was the main logic for you as far as picking the winner, considering there were two Asmussons in there? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Matt. This is a great uh, opportunity, and you allow that you know average fan to, to jump on. So thank you very much uh, for allowing me to be on the show. Um, there are a few things I liked about Jackie's Warrior. First of all, um, I knew that uh, he was not going to be the favorite. Um, Astros had had two. Um, this horse had been out working his stablemate in the mornings. I think a lot of people see that. And for you newer viewers out there, if you do not go on to XBTV and watch some of the workouts, it is an absolute must. Uh, this was a, uh, a big horse. 
Um, he was out working his uh, stable mate. And I just, I love the draw. I like outside posts, especially going uh, that distance in the sprint. He can just look to the inside, Rosario, and, and, and see what he's got. Uh, and ended up outbreaking the field and just went on with it, which I loved. Once he got the lead, um, I really thought that he was going to be tough. And just everything worked out. Um, he took the turn well. And I think this horse has a real future. I don't think this is just a anomaly where he, you know, he's just a stake runner. He's got a big stride to him. And I, I could see him running the champagne and being a factor in the fall for sure. And it's always interesting with these two-year-old races. It's, you know, you get the, it, it depends. Sometimes it's a matter of precocity, but other times it's an omen of things to come. Perhaps to your point, maybe a one-turn mile in the champagne is sort of a target for a two-year-old race at this point. I don't know. Like I said last week, maybe it's a little bit quick to be running back in the hopeful, but Given the modern day standards anyway, I'm sure many, many moons ago would have been an afterthought to run him in that race. No big deal. But um, it could be a bit of a precursor of things to come. Howard, let's get a little bit of background on you. Where are you from? Uh, what sort of your background as far as work is concerned and how long you've been involved with the races, X, Y, and Z? Sure. So I live in the northern suburbs of Chicago, about 20 minutes from Arlington, uh, which is a whole other conversation we're not going to get into. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's such a beautiful track and... Uh, Anyway, uh, hopefully they'll get things sorted out. Um, I, my background uh, in terms of getting into racing is sort of interesting. Uh, no one really in my immediate family is interested in horse racing. Um, however, my uh, grandfather on my mother's side, um, who unfortunately passed away before I was born, I'm actually named after him. Um, and he enjoyed going to the track, and he would take my mother to the track uh, once in a while. So I think the genes just sort of passed on from there. And then um, in high school, the, funny story of how I saw my first thoroughbred races. I was senior in high school, 1989. This was the first Saturday in November. So you can imagine maybe what, you know, what day that was. I went with a friend, went to Hawthorne, which is, you know, just outside Chicago. We had no idea what we were doing, who was running whatsoever. And we see some live races. And then all of a sudden there are these amazing races. There are like 10,000 people, which really crowded there. And they were showing the Breeders' Cup. We're like, what's this Breeders' Cup thing? We had no idea. It was at Gulfstream that year. Little did we know that year, some of the best races ever in the Breeders' Cup, including the classic between Sunday Silence and Easy Goer. And if people have not seen that YouTube video, check it out, because it's one of the best races in the Breeders' Cup of all time, if not just of any race of any era. Uh, Bayakoa won uh, that year in the, in the, in the Distaff. Uh, Go for One won the Philly uh, two-year-old race. So, I mean, some of the best horses that ever ran, ran that day. And I had no idea who these horses really were, but the crowds were going crazy, even though we were watching it on TV and, um, so I got my juices flowing and the rest is history. Um, after that, um, actually was a harness player for a while. Um, when I first started, which a lot of people talk about because they're all one mile races and it's just easy to handicap. Um, but then I started going to Arlington. I've been to the last about 10 or 15 millions before this past year and just um, started getting to pick fives a lot in the last 10 years or so with um, and a lot of horizontal betting. So um, that's my story. I just, I love the game. And as, as I told you a little before, um, just started getting to contests and stable duel and some other um, ways to bet. It's just a lot of opportunities out there right now. Couple little handicapping yeah. questions for you. Given the fact that you are sort of a Chicago guy and, and Arlington has been a track that you have frequented, um, A, what is sort of your just standard handicapping procedure and process? But then B, how did you specifically deal with the sort of transition from a dirt main track to a synthetic track? Was it an easy transition? Did you find it a little bit difficult with obstacles and things like that? Because I know that was always a big thing in Southern California and the folks up at Woodbine as well with the changeover, it, it, there's a learning curve to, to recognizing differences in surfaces. Sure. So, you know, I think the very first synthetic was Turfway, if I, if I remember correctly. And mm -hmm. so Arlington followed that when there were unfortunately a lot of breakdowns with horses and they were concerned about health and safety, but it definitely changes your perspective. Um, I do believe there are some biases, at least there were some biases at Arlington. I know, there's a common thought at, at Woodbine and other places that there are not biases, but I did find biases, especially speed biases um, on the inside uh, for some reason. And also with Chicago weather, because the temperature fluctuates a lot, I found that when it's colder, um, so earlier in the meet or later in the meet, speed holds a lot more. Um, and in the, in the summer months when it's hotter, it gets a little more waxy. 
and actually favors closers and it's a little bit of a slower track. So that took a while to learn. I mean, it was a learning curve for a while, um, but really what I liked about Arlington or, or still do, um, although I don't play much anymore, is the turf course is just is first class. It's one of the best turf courses in the country. Um, they're wide sweeping turns and um, they really had a nice turf course uh, there. Um, so that was the adjustment. And just to back to your previous question, I'm a high school math teacher. So throughout our conversation, you're definitely gonna hear a lot of statistics and uh, um, I tend to be a little bit too analytical at times, but I use the era formulator for the most part, but we can talk more about my process. And you brought up sort of the differences and I think it is something for folks to consider because there are still synthetic surfaces out there. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say the synthetic era is, is beyond us. I, I'm not going to be surprised. I'm not going to name names and, 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 you know, just sort of it would be a little bit irresponsible to just throw different places out there. But don't be surprised if sort of the synthetic move comes back in some fashion in, in some major jurisdiction, because I still think that I think there's still some some method and to the madness, some rhyme to the reason. I think there's there, there's something there. Uh, but to your point. It is something to keep in mind, differences in temperature, because I know, especially up at Woodbine as well, it, it's very similar to Chicago, where over the summer it gets hot, humid, it can get miserably uncomfortable, uh, similar to where I am in the Northeast. But then you get into spring and fall when it really cools down or you're running at night, and the track can play considerably differently. And I understand most people just think, oh, synthetic, it's just you know fast all the time. There, there are differences when weather comes in and things like that, and it's really no different than any other kind of track. Well, I always thought, you know, I, I love betting Hollywood, and I always thought they were, that, that was cushion, I believe. Yes. I always thought that was one of the best services in the country. Yes. I almost never saw a bias at Hollywood. Maybe a little bit at night, again, betting when it's colder there. Sometimes, again, getting back to the speed factor. But, um, you know, I, I welcome the synthetics. If, um, if that's what's going to keep a track open as opposed to just closing completely, I'm all for it, for sure. I, I think I know where you might be talking about, uh, but uh, we won't discuss that. So I'm, st I'm still hopeful that, and I, I know they probably wouldn't do it, and I've never understood why, but I mean, with all the construction going on, and I don't know anything about anything. I don't know if this is even something that would be considered. At Belmont Park, with all of the construction going on, you have all the, the Canadian horses who, for the most part, some of them will go down to Florida for the winter, but realistically, they're not down there. to. They're just down there for a vacation, more or less. The horses aren't super cranked up. They're just looking for some races to get prepped up and ready to go back to Toronto. If you threw in a synthetic track on the inner turf, I mean, you would have all three situations laid out. You've got the main track. You've got a nice still outer turf course, which is still going to be one of the nicer ones in the country. And then you throw in the all-weather surface down on the inside. I just, I've never understood why that wasn't a thing because you could continue running all throughout the winter. You would attract horses coming in from Canada. You'd attract horses that would typically be running at Presque Isle or somewhere else like that. I just, it was always one of those things that to me, I, I've never really understood the logic of it, but neither here nor there, like you say, conversation for another day. When it comes to your process, are you a speed player? You brought up that you are a, a math teacher. I would imagine numbers are rather pertinent as far as your analysis is concerned. Absolutely. Um, I mainly use DRF Formulator. It's completely changed the way that I uh, play. Um, and I know you're a big uh, fan of the Timeform US um, the early pace ratings of, of the time form U.S. to me are huge. Um, you never know. Sometimes horses don't always break. There's, you know, horses stumble. Um, there's jockey intent, especially on the turf in New York, which is driving me crazy along with, <laughs> I think, Andy Serling, a lot of other people with all the grabbing. Say, and all of us. Going, going to a half and 50. And actually, the race we're going to talk about today, I think, is a very murky pace situation. But looking at the uh, time form U.S. early pace figs, to me are important. And then in terms of my process, after trying to develop the race flow, I just look at buyers, I'm a buyer's guy. I know there's um, some people like the sheets and there's different ways to look at a race, but I think the buyers are an excellent tool. And I also look at class. So I just right, go right down to the past performances. Um, I personally don't believe a 90, if someone runs a 90 buyer in a 20 claimer, I just don't believe that that's necessarily the same as running a 90 buyer in a 40 claimer against much better horses. I know that's another you know conversation, but when you're running against better horses, sometimes you have to use your speed earlier or later at different times, and you're just stopping up in competition. So um, the number is the number, but I, I think there are circumstances um, where the number needs to be looked at carefully, especially if, for example, a horse gets loose on the lead. 
uh, like one of the horses actually running in our race today. Well, and I think it's a good point that you bring up. I, I believe the number is the number, but you have to throw the caveat in. It's how the number is earned. You know, it's a situation to your point. If you did it against far inferior company, if you did it when you were able to get off to a very, very easy lead. And I think that's one of the things that a product like Timeform US, they'll do sort of the work for you. I prefer to kind of use my own noodle and say, well, okay, maybe the horse was loose out there, but maybe it was a day where horses coming from off the pace actually ran quite well. That's not going to be factored in necessarily into the number just at face value. You need to do a little bit of homework and handicapping on your own. So I agree with you. I do. I look at it and say the numbers, they're very important, but it's how the number is earned. I think that ends up actually being the sort of the line of demarcation, the differentiating factor between a couple of horses that may look very comparable on paper. One may be coming out of a candy trip versus one who may be coming out of a very, very difficult situation. And if I could add also, uh, I've been since the uh, since New York started racing again. Um, and because I'm a school teacher, I have more time over the summer. I've actually been taking trip notes on literally every race in New York for the last uh, two months. And I have to say, since I've been doing that, and you can do it in your DR formulator, um, you can put your own trip notes in there. It's, you know, short comments. You can write a paragraph if you want. Um, this is the best Saratoga meet I've ever had. And I will admit that I've struggled at times at Saratoga, like everyone in Del Mar, especially with all the baby races. It's very difficult. But between um, looking, um, you know, at my own notes, which is very important, um, if you if you know how to look at a race correctly, and then also looking at um, all the pedigree, which is also very important. It's really helped my handicapping. And with trip notes, I would just recommend to everyone, and I know you're a believer in this, everyone can see the trouble trip. But what I've been doing a good job of recently is finding horses that get that perfect candy trip, maybe a pocket trip, and they, they run really well. And then next time they're, you know, five to two, three to one, and completely tossing them or maybe using them um, as a C horse and an ABC ticket maker ticket. So don't just get caught up in looking at the horses that have trouble because everyone can see that. You also need to look at the horses that get the perfect trip and assume that they probably won't get that the next time based on circumstances. And, and maybe this is just cherry picking from what we've seen most recently, but go back to the Travers this past weekend, and I understand neither of them won the race, but look at the two horses coming out of the Peter Pan. By anyone's estimation, Kara Caro had a more difficult trip that day given the ground loss, given the lengthy layoff as opposed to Country Grammar, who was able to scoot up the inside. And again, I don't really know what happened with Country Grammar, but Caracaro uh, acquitted himself quite nicely in that race in the Travers. And that's to your point that, you know, at face value, you look at it and say, oh, well, Country Grammar defeated Caracaro. Well, he also had a perfect trip that day, and Caracaro had to do a heck of a lot of running. So I think it is, I would say, as valuable, if not more valuable, to find the horse that you can fade as opposed to the horse that you want to bet off of certain trips. I mean, there's no question about it. And if you're a horizontal player, like I am, and you're playing pick fives and you have somewhat li limited budget, uh, the difference between a B or a C horse and a ticket maker it could be $75, $100, depending on your ticket. So, um, again, fading chalks. But then also, Matt, that will allow you to play some other longer price than other legs. It's not just fading. It's what your ticket will look like because you faded one of those lower prices. Now you can use that. 10 to 1, 12 to 1 as a B instead of a C, or maybe an A instead of a B. Um, and it, it can totally change the makeup of your ticket. Making your tickets as efficient as possible. That's ulti that, that's a, a side piece to this entire game. We can talk about going over the races and picking winners and this, that, and the other thing. But if you can't put together efficient and effective tickets, you're, you're kind of swimming upstream. It's just not going to end up working out. Now, again, there's different circumstances, different situations. If you're playing a pick five, versus playing a trifecta versus playing in a contest you're kind of looking at three entirely different things when they all come from the same sort of sample here that we're dealing with these horses and what they're coming into this race with and let's talk about this race here the ninth at saratoga on friday afternoon mile and three sixteenths on the melon it's a non-winners of two other than howard but i have to be honest i look at this and say this is a fringe stakes race you have many many accomplished runners you have horses who are maybe a little bit more lightly raced that can still take steps forward. Conversely, you have some old season veterans who maybe they're getting a little bit long in the tooth. Let's start off with the pace situation because you kind of alluded to it at the top. It could be a little little bit murky in a spot like this. Yeah, so first of all, this is a great race. I mean, this could easily, if there was such thing as a grade four yeah. race, you know, <laughs> this could be it. Only at Saratoga 
really, with all due respect to Del Mar, which, you know, is great racing also. But uh, this is a heck of a race. There's a lot of horses that can win. Um, they all have buyers, you know, between 85 and 95. These are some very high class animals. But in terms of the pace situation, um, Empty Tomb, who is a very interesting horse that we'll talk about, um, has a 103 early pace rating. If you look at Empty Tomb from the outside, which is a new horse in the Maker Barn, um, he's been running some pretty fast races early, and every race um, in the in the DR Formulator, for the most part, looks like favorites closers, which means he's being caught up in somewhat, you know, speed uh, duels to some extent. So um, after that, you, you've got, you know, um, Conviction uh, Trade, who's an 83, Voting Control 80, and the horse that I love the most, which we'll talk about, actually is not even close to the early uh, – pace fix, but I think he's going to be used early. So my guess is uh, Empty Tomb is going to go with Santana. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, perhaps Mr. Al is going to try to steal on the front end again. But um, I think this is very tricky from a pace perspective. Mr. Alec was one that I had kind of earmarked looking at it saying, I understand he was no match for value engineering in that run two starts back. But to your point, from a tactical standpoint, in all likelihood, he's probably going to get the jump on value engineering. And having said that, I guess the way that I looked at it, and I don't know if you agree or disagree, value engineering in his most recent run being as close to the pace as he was, I think it's one of those things with a lightly raced horse, you can see the differences. And, and uh, I, the only reason I'm bringing this up is because I recorded the uh, Derby Draft podcast for the In the Money Players podcast earlier this morning with PTF, JK, and Naomi Tucker. I, I Spoiler alert, I, I selected a horse called Pneumatic late in the rounds. Steve Asmussen has him. He's a, he's a nice little three-year-old. I don't think he's a superstar, but I've always been a fan. But I made the case that in the Matt win, which he ran in two starts back, he was very, very close to the pace. It figured prominently throughout. To me, that's not actually his ideal running style. I think he likes to come from a few lengths off of it, let things happen out front early, and then try to make a move. And that's kind of how I feel about value engineering in his most recent start. So the fact that he was up close to a hot pace and still ran well, I think you can say he's a feather in his cap, but frankly, I think he's better coming from a little bit farther off of it. The problem is that could end up being a bit of an issue here if the pace doesn't materialize. So that last race that value, I, first of all, I just want to say, and I could be completely wrong, I am totally against value engineering okay. this race. And I'll explain some reasons. So I got some DRF stats for you. You know I'm a numbers guy, so Matt, here you go. Chad Brown uh, has had 39 route turf starters at Saratoga mm -hmm. this meet. Um, we're filming on this on, on Tuesday, Tuesday for people at home. So this is before Wednesday's races. But how many races do you think Chad Brown has won at Saratoga this meet out of 39 turf routes? I know it's he's off to a bit of, for his standards, chilly out of 39. I'd say he's probably 15%, so put him somewhere around six. It's actually four. Okay. So not only one, that four one. out of four. You're pretty close, though. Only four out of 39. Now, he has a lot of in the money. Obviously, this horse can win. But it's ironic that the horse's name is Value Engineering because I do not think you're going to get very good value on this horse. The last race, he did get caught up in, in a bit of a speed duel. He was asked early, and then he was actually asked late again. It was a very weirdly one race. And Bundi Bunan was also in that race, by the way, who um, is the 11 horse in this race, mm -hmm. who I really don't like also, frankly. Um, but I, I really don't like Value Engineering because I don't think he's improving. I'm really looking for horses in this race that are improving. All his horse has done is run 88, 88, 90, 90. He is lightly raced, but from a value perspective, um, I just don't think he's a good bet. I really don't think he's getting any better. And I think there's other, the other Chad Brown, actually I'm much more interested in, and that would be the four voting control. Voting control is my second choice in this race. This horse was an extremely good two-year-old. Um, he was, you know, in the Brewers Cup, uh, almost beat Mendelssohn. He was right there. And, his last race was a year and a half layoff, and he really had no excuse in the race. He got a good trip, but he lost to a horse named Hierarchy. Hierarchy just came back at Ellis and almost beat Factor This, who was a nice, great state horse at Fairgrounds. So as a math guy, I do believe in the transit of property, which for those of you that don't know, if horse A beats horse B and horse B uh, can beat horse C, well, therefore, horse A must be better than horse C. Not necessarily. I think you have to be very careful. However, from a class perspective, I think voting control absolutely fits in this race. And I think he's going to be a higher odds than value engineering. 
And therefore, I like him as my second choice in this race. And, and what I will say about vo uh, voting control is you're right. The fact that, OK, he didn't get the job done in that return effort. But you take a look. He, he really ran into the hottest part of the pace, got a little bit tired late. When you consider that was his first start in, what, 13 months he had every right to need that race before you get that forward move. But to your point, I suppose there's a chance that you want to look at it and say with the Chad numbers thus far with the lack of success, which is not what we're accustomed to from Chad's barn, especially up at Saratoga. Maybe it's something to consider, but I agree with you. Voting control to me is the kind of horse he just has that profile of. He was a really, really nice two-year-old. And people, I know it's been a minute, but don't forget that that Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf, which is all the way back in 2017, that was that explosively productive race where you had Catholic Boy in there. You had this horse. You had Mendelssohn. Untamed Domain turned into a nice one. There were a couple other runners that went on to win graded stakes races as three- and four-year-olds. So he was always meant to be a good one. The problem is he just hasn't been sound. You know, but this is probably the first time since he was a two-year-old, perhaps, that he has consistent works. He's been working every seven days now. You have to think he's going to take a step forward. It would, it would be hard for me to believe that he takes a step back and if he takes a step forward into a mid-90 buyer there's no reason why he can't win this race as opposed to value engineering who i just don't really think has the upside and really hasn't improved much um, i'm not worried about the post with value engineering they're starting at the top of the stretch it's a very long run in the first turn i just think voting control will be a higher price and has more upside what do you do with a horse like current who for me I, look, I, I liked him a lot in the Pan Am, and he gave me a thrill. I thought he was going to get there, and then he couldn't even hang on for a second, which was a little bit disappointing. But he came back in the Tiller, a race that I didn't love. It's been fine enough, you know, as far as productivity is concerned. And then they ran him back in the UN, and he didn't really deliver there. We get an equipment change here scheduled for Friday with the blinkers going on. I'm of the opinion that he has been ridden incorrectly in the past two races. I think he's a horse that you need to get him involved from jump. But I suppose there's still a chance that maybe he's just not this good. What do you do with a horse like Curran? So, Matt, I'm just going to flat out and say it. Uh, I love Curran in this race. <laughs> Curran, is my, Curran is my top choice in this race by far. And in an ABC pick five ticket, he's going to be my lone A. Okay. He doesn't have to win the race from a value perspective. And as we're as this is being filmed on Tuesday, we don't have the morning lines. I'm guessing no one in this race I don't think is going to be below five to two. I just have a hard time. Seeing that, you got two Clements, you got two Chads. This horse, to me, uh, I love for some reasons. First of all, here's another stat for you. Ready? Irad and Pletcher, They're, that combination at Saratoga this meet. What do you? Uh, Fifteen starts for uh, Pletcher has put Irad, uh, Irad on. How many wins out of fifteen this meet uh, for Irad Ortiz and Todd Pletcher? I would, I would say at least, or I shouldn't say at least, but probably close to thirty percent, so somewhere in that five range. Nine. nine. They are nine. They are nine for fifteen at this meet. Sixty percent. If you saw a stat that was sixty percent, I mean, th this race uh, to me screams of intent, jockey intent. I think Pletcher just wants to get some comments into the source. Uh, I love the source. You know, earlier he had some weird when he was a two-year-old, three-year-old. He had some weird trips. He couldn't get out of the gate very well. Like you mentioned, if you look at the uh, short comments and the pad, the trouble lines. You know, bobble break, bobble breaks that. Uh, this horse definitely wants to be up close. I think the blinkers is a telltale sign. He's been working well. I hope Irad puts him into the game, maybe a few lengths off the lead. And look who he's been facing. I mean, he's been in great stakes races. Um, he's been facing very tough horses. He you know, was right there um, with Zulu Alpha, like you said, in the, in the Pan Am, the Savage Joy, the Belmont race. The last race, he didn't break great. I thought Garrett was sort of rode him very passively. He was three wide. And I, I just didn't really like the ride. And he got a 92 buyer to me running his B minus or C plus race. Well, that buyer puts you, if you believe in buyers, that puts you as good as anyone in this race, if not better. So I love this horse for a lot of reasons. Um, I think he's eight to five, nine to five to win this race. And I think I'm going to get, you know, three to one, seven to two. And I would, be happy to put a win bet him in this spot. He's my top choice. And I'm glad that you've laid it out that way from a value standpoint. Again, I, I've, I sound like a broken record, but I've talked about making your own value line and assessing what you think the probability of a horse winning is and kind of juxtaposing that to what the public is suggesting. And really, that should be the only thing that guides you as far as whether you bet to win or you don't. Because when you're getting the best of it, 
that's when you need to push. And when you're not, that's when you need to say, you know what? We There's another race in 25 minutes. Don't need to go shooting right now. I'm guilty of it occasionally where I look at it and say, you know what? I think the horse should be two to one. You know, maybe we're at nine to five. You know, am I really going to split hairs that much? I probably should. I don't. I end up saying nine to five. I'm fine with. I made him two to one. I think he's a 33% chance to win, but it is what it is. I understand there are some people, though, that specifically will only play, and I, I talk about Barry Meadows' book all the time, the idea of getting that tremendous overlay, that 50% on top, factoring in the fact that you're going to be flat out wrong sometimes. Just going to, more often than not, I shouldn't say sometimes, you're going to be wrong a lot. The idea of factoring in that overlay the way that you've laid it out, if you believe he's going to be, you think he's that sort of 8 to 5-ish chance, so that puts you somewhere in that 40-plus percent range that you think he's going to win this race out of 100, I mean, it, it, you're probably going to get every bit of that 50% and then some, to your point, you probably end up in that 7 to 2, 4 to 1 range. I just think he's faced the best horses. I think he can improve the blinkers on. I think Irad is a huge, and, you know, Franco's been on him before. There's nothing wrong with <laughs> I think he's had a pretty good uh, weekend last he's weekend. Right. He's the law. You know, he's a good young jockey. But, you know, Irad, to me, is the best turf rider in the country. Um, and, and so I think there's just a lot of intent here. But just other than that, he's, he's got the best figs. Uh, when he races well, he's been facing the toughest horses. I think he's got a nice draw, and I think he fits. Uh, I do. I would like to talk about Mr. Alec for a minute because I got one more stat for you. Mr. Alec uh, won last time. He got a huge uh, buyer, got 95, but, again, it was on the lead and it was an extremely weak field. He beat one decent horse and, and tied at the sea, but, and he ran very well. Listen, I take nothing away from him because Rosario and Clement have been absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. This if people are paying attention, but there's a few buts for me. First of all, this is a much more difficult race than the last one. Number one, number two, I think he is going to see some pace pressure either from current, hopefully, or empty tomb for sure. And number three, here's the last stat. Christopher Clements bring the source back in 12 days, Matt. So he's run 2,360 races in the last five years. How many do you think in those 2,360 has he come back in 12 days or less with a horse? Uh, I, I would, if I had to guess, I would say less than 2%. Seven. Uh, so no, only so seven out of 2,300. <laughs> he, he, he did win once. Uh, he, he won with Black Type two years ago in the yeah. Knickerbocker at Aqueduct. So he has won before. This is really a tough horse for me to gauge. I can see this horse just improving again and winning by three and me being just completely wrong. But the fact he's coming back so quickly, I'm just not sure because Clement's a very patient guy. So I'll just leave it up to the to the viewer on what to do with him. Uh, maybe he's just feeling so good that he, you know, he's just going to draw up and win again. Um, I'm a bit dubious, and I think he's going to be a very low price again because of the connections. And we'll find out, like you say, from a tactical standpoint, he's not a horse that needs the lead, but it feels like he does his best running when he is forwardly placed. And I'm also always curious about, and I suppose I could say the same thing about current, but at face value, it, it he's probably where I would be leaning in here. The mile and three sixteenths to me could be a difference for a horse like Mr. Alec, where it feels like he's really taking that next step going out to the mile and three eighths. I mean, this is a significant turn back in distance, and there is a, regardless of what people want to think, there's a tremendous difference in speed going a mile and three eighths, a mile and a half, than speed going a mile and an eighth, mile and three sixteenths. They're just you're going to likely have to go a heck of a lot faster early than you would in those longer races. Therefore, maybe you get sapped a little bit turning for home, and that's when I think the real kick for some of these horses who could be in close attendance but don't need the lead. That's when that could come into play. Well, just one other thing I want people to consider, with Mr. Alec, he's French bred. A lot of French horses like the turf to be a little bit soft. When you look at the past performances, it says firm. Anyone who's been watching Saratoga, the, the, the course has not been really that firm, even when it says firm. I think, as you know, you're out east right now. The weather's warming up. It's supposed to be beautiful all week. So I'm anticipating this weekend and Friday, probably the first time that this course is actually getting harder and firmer. And I think there's a chance this horse just really relished the somewhat softer ground. Again, I know it says firm, but if you watch the replay of that race, they were you know kicking up clods of grass. That was not what you consider really a firm turf course. That might be to his disadvantage, uh, might be nitpicking, but I think it's something to consider for sure. The Friday feature for this Friday, August the 14th, race number nine at Saratoga, mile and three sixteenths, non-winners of two other than on the Mellon turf course. It's a nice field 
It's a full field. I believe the weather's supposed to cooperate, so basically just draw a line through those MTOs, and if it comes off the turf, blame me. It's fine. Um, Howard Kravitz, ultimately, your final selection for this race is? So I'm going with current. I love this horse. I'm going 8 4 10 3. And if you're a contest player, use Empty Tomb, the brand new uh, make in, in the Maker Barn. Very interesting horse. I would key that horse underneath in second and third uh, with current and maybe uh, the four horse and try to get a nice try out of it also. Howard, awesome analysis, great statistics. You know I like numbers. I like to hear all these sort of things, for better or for worse. Try to find some signal in the noise somewhere. It's always good information, and it hopefully it gives folks a different way of looking at things. If they're just sort of set in their ways of doing things, that's all I could encourage to anyone is continue to be willing to look at different things. Don't just get set in your ways and say, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Always be willing to tweak and tinker just a little bit because you never know when you're going to come across something that could help in the long run. Howard Kravitz. Where can we, are you on Twitter? I am. So I'm at, at H Kravitz, K-R-A-V-E-T-S, uh, at H Kravitz is my Twitter handle. I'd love to hear from you. And um, this has been a real honor, a real pleasure. Thanks again, Matt. Hopefully I'll be on again and hopefully we'll get current home with maybe empty tomb underneath. Very good. Good luck this weekend here, Howard, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you again for coming on and continued support. We really appreciate it. Great. Thanks a lot. Take care, Matt. Thank you. Thank you again to Howard Kravitz for the help with this week's Friday feature. Again, beneath the video player on YouTube, leave one selection for your winner of this Friday's ninth race up at the spa. The non-winners are two other than going a mile and three sixteenths on turf. If you are one of the lucky winners, I will contact you and we'll see if we can get you on here, be in the position that Howard is in. But next Monday, standard timing. This week was a little bit uh, sideways. Next week, back to the Monday schedule. So again, Thank you to Howard. Let's dive into my Breeders' Cup Classic Top 10. Let me know your Top 10 beneath the video player on YouTube, as many of you did last week. And Q&A will come back next week as well. I just figured this week was a good one to dive into those three grade ones, and then we'll touch on this as well. I kind of am of the opinion that if you don't run, or let's just use like college football as the example. If you don't play, and let's say the number three team, does and they let's say they beat uh, the number seven team in the country i don't think that means that you as the number one team should be penalized and that's why i'm not changing a ton as far as my top 10 is concerned i have tom's day tile ranked number one i have improbable ranked number two for the same reasons that i did last week improbable really strong performance i want to know would he have done that or been able to do that if tom's day tile did not have the issue uh, I, and there was a commenter who said, oh, it's a small stumble, not the end of the world. I beg to differ, um, but that's the beauty of trips and trouble and things like that. It's all subjective. It's what you think, how substantial or, uh, you know, not that big a deal the issue was. I think it was a pretty major issue, a pretty major stumble for Tom Zeta and that Whitney. I think it would have been an entirely different race if he broke alertly, but I respect if, if some folks don't think it was that big a deal and improbable is just that good at this point. So I kept them one and two. Tis the law remains number three. I can understand anyone that says he is sort of on the up and up. And if that's the case, then, you know, those uh, regardless, even if he doesn't improve much, those top two or, or anyone on any of these lists, they're going to need to have him screwed on tight if they're going to beat Tis the law. I could very easily see folks making him number one. I think it would be a little bit premature simply because he is not running against older horses just yet. But having said that, boy, visually he checks all the boxes. I kept him three, kept maximum security at four, kept by my standards at five, Tacitus at six, Code of Honor at seven. A new face, a new fresh face to my ranking. He was an unranked. Now he is number eight. He ran well enough. And I shouldn't even say well enough. I thought he ran well in the Ellis Park Derby on Sunday. That's Art Collector. Now, Art Collector, if if you are looking for a three-year-old to upend Tis the Law, I think in all likelihood, it's either the horse I have eight or the horse I have nine. I have Art Collector eight, I have Honor AP nine. Art Collector, I like that he has proven over the Churchill Down strip. I like his running style. I like that he can go to the lead. He can sit just off of it. He has many similar traits to that of Tis the Law. He's not quite as fast as Tis the Law, but it's not as though he's living in a different area code. He's he's reasonably close. He's within a few points. I, he's still, I don't know if he's green or what the deal is, but he's always been a little bit goofy with his leads. 
I don't love that. In the Sellers Park Derby, he was early with the lead change on the far turn, and he popped back to his left lead just before the wire. I don't love to see that. Um, that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that's listened to this show for any period of time. But he is pretty darn good. And he's kind of a fun story, a little bit more under the radar as far as the connections are concerned. Um, I just think he's interesting. So I brought him up. I moved him to number eight. Honor AP, I made it clear last week how disappointed I was in his performance, but the the logic of it being nothing more than a stepping stone to get to the main prize, I'm willing to buy that. I kept him at nine, and Midnight Beast, who is number 10. Again, I don't think she really lost much in the personal line since she ran a really good race, Vexatious. She's brought her game to a new level. And Midnight Beast, who I think if she shows up here, uh, she deserves some sort of consideration. I don't know if she will or not, but... I'll keep her at 10 right now as a placeholder in case they choose to go somewhere else or somebody else kind of makes their name and their case for being involved in this Breeders' Cup Classic conversation. Let me know if you agree, disagree, uh, pros, cons, think this is a silly list, think it's a good list, whatever it may be, beneath the video player on YouTube or on Twitter at Bernier underscore Matt. Again, Friday feature this week, Saratoga race number nine. Leave your selection beneath the video player on YouTube. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Bernier underscore Matt. Questions, comments, concerns, you know the drill by now. Uh, however you listen to this thing, thank you for doing so. Please rate, review, and subscribe. Whether it's on Apple Podcasts, leave us a positive rating. Whether it's on your Android device, whether you listen to the show on InTheMoneyPodcast.com, whether you listen to it and watch it on YouTube like some of you do. And I appreciate however you take this thing in, well, whatever you do. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe. And if you're on YouTube, make sure the bell icon's lit up so you get a notification anytime anything new is uploaded to the In The Money podcast page. That includes the Thursday happy hours, which will be happening from now and through the Breeders' Cup. I will not be on this week because I'll be getting ready to head up to Saratoga. Uh, Saturday, 5 o'clock Eastern on NBC, we will be there for the Alabama I believe it's a win and you're in for the Breeders' Cup Distaff. So some of the three-year-old girls will have an opportunity to punch their ticket to the starting gate for the Breeders' Cup Distaff down at Keeneland in November. Until next week, next Monday to be exact, this has been episode 27 of the Matt Bernier Show. Good luck however you play, whatever you play, and wherever you